Hi everyone, today we're doing something a little bit different. Today, instead of doing one of my deep dives into tech, startups, or AI, I'm actually gonna be conducting an interview with an expert in the field. And today we're gonna to be interviewing an old friend of mine on how AI is transforming marketing. So who are we talking to? Roman Garcia is a data-driven senior marketer with decades of experience in all sorts of different verticals and industries, whether it's direct-to-consumer or B2B. He has worked with so many brands that we all know and love that I need to read it off the list because there's no way I'm going to be able to pull this off. He has directly worked for brands like Best Buy, eBay, DirecTV, and then on the agency side, he has managed clients like Procter & Gamble, Capital One, Diageo, Diageo? I am not sure and I did not double check and we don't have time to reshoot this. Dick Sporting Goods, Smuckers. He's also consulted for some pretty big firms, including McKinsey, Adobe, the USOC, aka the Olympic Committee, StubHub and Mercedes-Benz, in addition to dozens of startups that you may or may not have ever heard of. He loves following trends, social media platform changes, concerts, dogs, but yet tragically, he still has not mastered any TikTok dances, much to our chagrin. How dare you, Roman? How dare you not dance? But my favorite work stories that Roman shares are about his time at eBay when he was one of the original team members there and oversaw some pretty big changes like buying out a few critical companies that you may or may not have heard of. I met Roman back in 2017 when we were both working at the venture capital firm Loeb NYC and he has been a great friend and was also an unofficial advisor for me when I was building out my own startup home surfing. So let's, without further ado, let's jump into it. Well, welcome Roman. Thank you so much for joining us today. And can, can we start by having you introduce yourself to our audience? I know I talked about you a little bit, but I forget, how did your career start? Did you start at Best Buy or were you somewhere else? No. I actually didn't. And thank you for that really nice intro. Anything else I could add to it would probably put a not positive spin on myself. So you made me look really great. So I appreciate that, Carolyn. Um, always happy to help. I'm always so happy no, to make you look good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, actually, I started off as a journalist. And it's funny because okay. if you looked on my LinkedIn profile or if you looked at my CV, mm -hmm. I never included. I recently started to include it. Um, because I feel like I should be kind of proud of, of that era. So this is sort of like the early, we just started having dial-up internet kind of thing. I was doing the music beat uh, in Tempe, Arizona, because I went to Arizona State. I went to the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. And uh, I started working for random newspapers around the city. Um, and I did it for the first seven years, like kind of, halfway through college before I got to Best Buy where I made the switch to marketing full time. I wanted to be a journalist. My father actually started off as a journalist before he became a professor. So it was sort of like my thing, like my dream job was to be the editor of Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> Obviously that did not happen because I'm here <laughs> speaking with you today. So, um, and the sad part is a lot of these newspapers are now defunct. So like, I can't go back and look yeah. for archives of things that I wrote. Um, I will say that I probably did lose about 30% of my hearing. I'm just guesstimating because I would literally go to concerts yeah. and review them for papers, um, which was fun. You know, free concerts are always great. But yeah, I, I came to a point where there was an opportunity. I had a friend who worked for... Uh, the Best Buy Corporation and talked to me about brand merchandising. Um, you know, I had studied various verticals of marketing principles in college, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. Like my backup plan was actually to go into politics because my minor was political science. So that was like my other passion. Um, so none of those careers worked out. So isn't I ended that, up in Isn't so that always I how am. it happens? Um, all right. It's so you went from journalism to uh, Best Buy and then eBay? Yeah. So I started off on the brand side um, with merchandising and then 
for eBay, I transferred into brand partnerships mm -hmm. and integrated campaigns. So like literally learning on the fly because I didn't remember half yeah. the things I learned in college, like most of us don't, right? Um, and uh, it was, to this day, I will say that eBay was the best experience I've ever had. No offense to my other yeah. uh, employers or future people who hire me for something, but eBay was just, you know, at the time, it was still one of the darlings of Silicon Valley. It was extremely profitable. Um, it was when people still wanted to buy weird things on the internet and there was only one place to go to. Um, we didn't have yeah. like, the, the dark web back then. Yeah. So, there was, so the dark web was eBay basically. And um, it was really great, um, you know, working across um, different organizations, working with PR, working with the brand team, the merchandising team, um, did a lot of social impact work. Mm -hmm. um, worked with a lot of celebrities, uh, basically just sort of kind of like um, brand awareness marketing for the actual brand itself. And um, that's kind of like a fun job where it's like your job is just to make your company look yeah. cooler than it already is. Um, I can honestly say I don't think I ever had a bad day at eBay except when <laughs> my whole department got laid off because of the uh, because of the right. you know, the recession in 2008 and the big the mm -hmm. big bust and boom. Um, the big short. So the big short basically is what <laughs> ruined me, my, my career at eBay. So yeah, oh that, was the, that was the only well, bad day there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roman. Okay, so I'm going to start this off by, I, we're here to talk about marketing and AI and like what we're seeing when it comes to the future yeah. and whatnot. So. Uh, my first question for you is, what are you most excited about when it comes to AI and marketing? What are you seeing coming up in the future? It may sound sort of like kind of a dry answer, but what I really am excited about is how quickly AI has been integrated into automation tools. So, you know, I've worked with clients who that's kind of like what they need. And sometimes getting somebody up to speed with automation tools um, for like everything from like lead generation um, to SEO, things like that yeah. are kind of difficult. I've realized that AI has just sort of made that so much simpler for like just a simple person like me who is not like, you know, I, I'm not a coder, I'm yeah. not a tech person per se, but I know how to work some of these tools and, you know, for example, somebody, let's say a startup who's like building their website and they're bootstrapping it, right? And they have to perfect their SEO. Um, there are free tools. You don't even have to, I mean, there are tools you can pay for, like Salesforce invested a lot into AI to uh, integrate into Salesforce and other of their CRM tools. Um, you know, you could go to Bart or Claude now and say, hey, you know, perfect my SEO on my website and basically give the code and it'll spit out something that is just like 10 times better than what you would have done or what you could have yeah. paid somebody to do. Um, that's also kind of scary because of the labor market and how it impacts that. So I, I feel like sort of that, how quickly we went from automation tools being AI perfected or optimized is like, awesome because i think it sort of when you're kind of creating your marketing stack that's sort of the one where it's like the heavy lift part of it um the second part of it is creative now that's sort of to me it's a double-edged sword i think i'm excited what ai has been able to do for creatives because at the end of the day i still feel you need a human being to oversee some of the stuff, some of the work that's being done by AI. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, last year, Coca-Cola had the first um, ad that was both developed by a human and also used AI tools. And um, it won a lot of awards, but it was a unique balance of natural photography, design yeah. and AI generated imagery. And I thought like, this is like a really great way of using AI yeah. for creative, but 
then I go on to um, Instagram or LinkedIn and I see, no offense, but I see the ugliest AI created images for every B2B company that doesn't have yeah. the money that most B2B companies have. And you know, 100% that this was created by AI and whatever they entered into the prompt must have had a misspelling yeah. or something because it does not look good. And there was no human oversight. And so yeah. that scares me a lot because I'm inundated by very awful, uh, awful creative content. And I, and I love creative. Um, yeah, but I still it's feel really funny because like the AI ads, I feel like are really easy to spot. Um, and in some ways it's like kind of eye catching because it's like, Absolutely. what's that? And then it's like, oh, that was made by AI. And there's something about that. I, I don't know that this is going to last forever because I think we are going to see way more AI generated ads, whether we like it or not. But they're like really easy to spot. And I'm like, really, I like right. judge them for it. Like, I'm like, ew. <laughs> and I and I know that's probably not going to last forever. But right now yeah. there's like an ew factor where I'm like, uh, that doesn't look good. I'm not impressed by that. Yeah, especially yeah, the static yeah, yeah. ones, right? So like the banner ads. That's where you're, where you're just like, yeah, you you probably should have kind of yeah spent the money on like a designer or just made something simpler answering a prompt. Um, that um, looks better. Yeah, right. Simplifying exactly simplifying the prompt always results in sort of like the closest to what your goal was. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of companies just for costs saving efforts are just having somebody go in and just enter prompts and having it spit out. And then somebody, you know, six titles yeah. above saying, I like that one, let's go with that one. Not knowing exactly like what the purpose of the, or the context yeah. of the ad is so or what they're I, I guess to, maybe we've already you know. covered this, but in case there's something yeah. that we missed. Uh, so we asked, we talked about what you're most excited about when it comes to AI and marketing, what are you most worried about? Is it the fact that we're going to see an overflow of all of these ads or are there more things that you're thinking about? Yes, that's part of it, but I think it'll, it'll course correct yeah. itself eventually because people will come to realize that there needs to be someone who actually um, studied creative design and can provide mm -hmm. the oversight when working with AI to create content. So I think that will course correct itself in the next seven to eight months, even yeah. with these B2B companies. I think what scares me or what, what I think is going to be a big change, and I have this sort of kind of ongoing argument with people in that industry, is mm -hmm. media buying. So programmatic media buying, that's literally everybody does it. You use DSPs where you push a button you segment things, you you know, AI is going to be really great at getting all this raw data, segmenting things perfectly so you're not wasting your money, serving up ads to consumers who yeah. don't meet the criteria for what you're trying to sell, right? What I tell my media friends or the arguments we have, I said, you know, optimizing it so perfectly this way is going to end up with prices of CPP, PPCs going mm -hmm. down, thus you're going to make less money because you're going to be able to know much faster that something's not working. So you can cut off like a media spend mm -hmm. immediately instead of like, you know, traditionally. So, you know, I work with, I worked at Publicis for a, a while and I had a really good friend who was on the media side and we worked together on some pretty big accounts. And um, it was I always eye opening to me that, you know, millions and millions of dollars were being spent on these campaigns. And there were these, I'd had to sit through these 155 page decks when it was their turn to go talking about their media yeah. strategy and everything. AI just completely eliminates that now. There's not gonna be a need for that long of a deck. But when I think about what AI will actually provide brands and buyers on the on the purchasing side is that they're gonna be able to say, you yeah. know, we don't have to spend 
$25 million on a campaign anymore because we could spend half of that and reach the actual target and use the other money for a future campaign, save it, provide savings to the company. He doesn't believe that. He's like, no, we'll still find a way to, to charge them. I was like, I was like, but how though? Because, because it's becoming media buying is becoming more and more kind of, you know, a one-stop shop. I don't know if you've ever used the, the Hulu platform yeah, for, yeah. Um, for streaming. Mm -hmm. So like kind of loading up your interstitials in 15 seconds. I mean, you know, I have an account. I can make yeah. a video for a product and load it up myself and just hit set my rate and everything. AI can perfect that even more so now because of the way that they can segment the target audience. So I I tell him, I say, there's gonna be no need for human oversight because you can tell me why I should spend an extra $10 million, but AI is gonna tell me, actually, no, you, you only need to spend $12 million to reach your target audience. Yeah. So, I think the media companies. Well, it's the are whole thing that I had in my rating. last video too. Of and, the um, like part of the reasons why how... journalism is having such a difficult time now when it comes to um, trying to do things digital or trying to exist is that when the internet came around, marketing prices went way, way, way down. If you consider the budgets for a major television ad versus you know a little banner ad on a website that everybody is clicking on it's gotten so much lower. So it sounds like with AI, this is happening again, but it's not necessarily with the distribution. It's more with uh, just with the data and knowing whether or not the correct ads are going to the right people. Right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And so like, I fully expect, you know, one of the things that has always been consistent, there's never been a down year in the history mm -hmm. of the last 30 years, Super Bowl ads have gone up in price incrementally by, you know, 500,000 to a million to 2 million, depending on yeah, it's why we all know what the Super Bowl is. you, you know, have your ad <laughs> placed. <laughs> it, it, oh, that, that's for a whole nother episode. I just, and yes, they, they, they are, they are actually the number one of my, Please don't use AI they're to as create your but that makes them so because noticeable. they're absolutely <laughs> But, you know, I wonder, you know, what is AI and sort of reaching that target audience, that peak target audience, what's it going to do to TV advertising as well? I mean, if, if you think about it, like, what's it going to do? Because people, a lot of people watch events like the Super Bowl. Some of them watch it for the commercials. Some of them watch it for the halftime show. Some of them watch it for the game. But they're not all equally the same audience member. So I feel that TV advertising is probably going to take a hit with AI um, just because yeah. of the, also the increase of people cutting the cord, right, and streaming things. And what you may be streaming, even though you're streaming the Super Bowl, the, the ads that are served up to you may be yeah, different than yeah. the ads that are served up if you're watching broadcast television, right? So, um, so that's that's another thing that concerns me with media buying, and that's why I I refuse to get off my uh, my box about media buying is going to lose money mm -hmm. year over year. The better AI gets with targeting. And it's already starting to happen, despite the fact that we know, uh, I believe in the next three years, it's an $80 billion industry with DSPs. So just like you putting in your budget and and I think it's going to reach something like mm -hmm. $1.7 by 2029 um, in terms of AI-powered automation tools, including programmatic buying. I think that that would be a concern if I was in that industry versus maybe a couple other ones. Publishing, same exact thing. I mean, we all saw what Sports, uh, Sports Illustrated did, like 
and what happened to Sports Illustrated. And, you know, um, for anyone who are paying attention, could you just do a very quick overview on what happened with Sports Illustrated? Yeah, well, so Sports Illustrated had a lot of layoffs about a year and a half ago. Um, and then they began using AI to write articles um, with um, kind of ambiguous bylines. So people thought that these were actually Yeah, they made like fake reporters, reality, right? Was, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, funny enough, I don't know if you remember this, but our former boss mm-hmm. right. His- at the VCW, um, he, he, he worked in um, Sports Illustrated's division. Yeah, he invented the, the football phone. For- Michael Love invented, invented the football, the football phone. <laughs> So, you know, we're, we're like five degrees away from the football <laughs> phone. Yes. I think we're two degrees. Um, I think we know. Are we two degrees? I don't now? know how that works. I, mean, I don't know how the degrees work, but we know I, the inventor I, I mean, you know of the football phone. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. But we know who created the football phone. There are very few people <laughs> who are going to watch this and say, I know the person who worked. Listen, phone. there's going to be people who watch this who are going to be like, "What the heck are these guys talking about?" Exactly, um, and then they're going to Google it, and they're going to be like, "People had these in their homes," and then when they read the numbers, they're going to be like, "Hundreds of millions of people had this." Had and this was Carolyn homes. Ann Roman's and boss. What? Yes, a <laughs> genius, a, literally a genius to come up with that just to sell <laughs> magazines. I mean. Amazing. We could have a whole podcast about him and what he created <laughs> and how he changed the industry the pu- in publishing. But, I should maybe um, invite him on the show sometime. <laughs> I probably should. should. I haven't talked um, to him in a bit, but he'd probably yes. do it. Hi, but, Michael. Um, <laughs> so, so that part scares me, the media part. The um, reporting journalism scares me because of what happened with Sports yeah. Illustrated, um, because I feel clickbait titles are becoming more and more overtly, like, you know, it's yeah. clickbait. Like, I will I will read a title on, like, CNN, and I won't even click the article because I know that it's not going to actually relate to what the title is. And it's was. so funny when, like, clickbaity that- titles go viral on uh, the app formerly known as Twitter. And and then people are like, yes. oh, no, I can't believe this happened. It's like, you realize that that title has nothing to do with the article? <laughs> That's Absolutely so nothing to do. And I think that, um, and it's so egregious that I feel like there has to be some type of regulation. And hopefully the government, thankfully, it's like the one bipartisan thing that, they all agree is upon is it. that we need to regulate AI right. in some capacity. Um, so uh, bravo, bravo to them. It doesn't matter which party you're, 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 you're in, but bravo that they both agree that there needs to be some type yeah. of regulation because if not, we're going to get ourselves into some deep, For deep. Sure. So, I, am, yeah. I am very happy to see how much that they are talking about AI regulation in, in that regard. Yeah. All right. Um, so speaking of, uh, AI and publishers, um, and all that jazz, I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is about marketing funnels. So what marketing funnels do you think are the strongest at the moment? And then my other question, so you can try to answer these together or split them up if you'd like, I don't care. Um, is how would you advise publishers on how to create content that actually gets clicks? Um, whether that is making something super clickbaity. Um, or if it's something else that you think is going to be a better strategy. So the marketing funnels, what are the areas that have the most eyeballs right now? Um, and how, um, how to create content that gets people's attention? Those are really good questions. Um, <laughs> man, what? <laughs> I even gave you the questions ahead of time. <laughs> Okay, everyone, for the record, she sent it like five minutes before this started. So I'm a monster. Not- <laughs> um, so obviously, the strongest is marketing funnels. Um, with AI, I think we've already answered that. I think it's automation. Mm-hmm. So because it seamlessly is part of 
every sales funnel. So it's kind of hard to say there's something better yeah. than that or something that's uh, has worked um, so seamlessly. So I think that's the strongest at the moment. I would say secondly is uh, people who know how to use it uh, for creative mm-hmm. purposes. I think that's the second strongest part of it. Um, I've seen some really great work from some really great agencies who are integrating AI into their production, uh, their video um, editing, um, certain editing tools. Um, Adobe has invested a lot into, of money. Yeah, buying um, out into that, AI. That today. Yeah, I'm yes, um, and I think uh, and you know I think they lucked out with not being able to acquire Figma because they don't need Figma yeah. anymore because what with AI they can just kind of do their own thing and and further develop uh, Adobe XD, I yeah. think it's called. So, yeah, so I think they saved themselves almost a billion dollars and instead just kind of repurposed that money for AI. So I think those two are the strongest at the moments um, because they both integrate into the, your traditional sales funnel, right? So lead generation, acquisition, marketing, retention, that all has, you know, automation, and um, creative content from your basic copy writing to your boring B2B um, mailers to your very just uh, fancy TV advertising um, videos, things like that. That's that's what I think now. If you ask me next week, probably we'll have a completely different answer because things are just moving so yeah. fast that next week we'll probably wake up and there'll be something happening that will say, Oh, well, forget last week's conversation. Yeah. This is what is the strongest um, influence AI has on marketing yeah. funnels. All right. So how do you advise publishers on how to actually get clicks? If you're a startup, if you are uh, a, a magazine or website or whatever, a small company, how do you advise um, these types of clients perhaps on how to get clicks and how to be successful in this new environment. And I know this is gonna change a lot, but what are you seeing right now that looks really promising? So I know of a startup that has done something really great. And I would encourage everyone who's sort of in that position or is in a position where let's say they're a freelancer and working on things. Um, All of us are, at least most of us who probably are watching this, um, have had to at one time come up with a either strategy brief or a creative brief for a project, right? Um, what I would recommend to publishers, startups, somebody who's trying to get attention with your human hand, write that brief and then go to a free AI tool and ask the AI to optimize your brief Mm -hmm. and um all the people that i've spoken to who have done this have said that it's been really really helpful because what some of these ai tools do especially the the good ones um they will source and cite articles examples that you can look at that sort of kind of give you a ah this is how I should be doing it versus how I originally thought I should be doing it. So it's not, you know, as long as you're not stealing from these examples, but you're learning from them and the AI helps optimize what your brief is, especially if you're going to distribute the brief to more than one person. So if the brief is for you, that's great. Um, But if you're going to give it to other people, you got to make sure that you, you know, have citations of where you got some of this information from. Um, But I highly recommend you do that to give you sort of ideas and tools and actual examples of companies who've successfully used these techniques to get more eyeballs on whatever product they're trying to sell. So let's say that I'm in the CPG business and I've created a a skincare uh, solution for 
um, Hispanic males over the age of 50. I don't know if you know any of them. <laughs> I do myself. But let's say, you know, I want to create um, clip, clickable content that's not necessarily clickbaity, but is clickable, like you want to learn more. What can I do? So first I can write a brief of what my goals are, um, what the end result I'd like it to be, examples of sort of maybe copy that I wanted to use, and then see what the AI comes back with in terms of like examples of what's worked in that industry, um, maybe identifying competitors that I didn't know existed. That's one thing I, I, I one startup that I've worked with said that they found out about a competitor in Europe that they had no idea about at all in their research, but the AI basically did the research and gave them all this. And then they realized, oh, there's like literally somebody in Europe doing exactly what we're That's trying so to do. Yeah, so, especially for if you're coming up with like trying to come up with a startup idea. I was at a party last night and ran into this girl who was like, oh yeah, I'm building a startup that does this and this and this and this and this. And I'm like, actually, um, that exists. That's the Saturday app by Cliff, Cliff Lerner. He's my, we're, we're like, you know, yeah. we, we chat every once in a while and he's like a former founder of like a major uh, dating app. Like uh, you should definitely look that up. And it's the type of thing where in previous years, it would be lucky if you ran into somebody like me who was able to be like, oh, actually you're using the wrong terms to go and look for something like this. But if you type it into maybe not chat GPT, but maybe something that is connected to the internet that's able to do a search for you, especially being able to figure out what's current. Yeah. I mean, yeah and what's happening. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you're in the incubation stage, if you're a, an entrepreneur right now who has an idea, mm -hmm. I think the first thing that maybe if you take anything away from so far in this conversation is use AI to find out if there's already competitors out there that you're not aware of, that your research team didn't find, that you didn't find, maybe it's so early in the incubation stage that you think, I haven't seen this. But there's there are so many companies out there that we don't know about. Use AI as your research mm -hmm. assistant. Um, Do you think? Now, don't use AI to write your <laughs> thesis, but definitely use it to research your idea because it might already exist. And guess what? If it doesn't, then you have a leg up and you know that maybe your runway is a little longer than somebody who's going to come up with the same idea three yeah. months down the line. Speaking of AI um, and looking forward, one of the comments that we've been getting a lot um, just in the last several videos that we have made, that I, I have made, I'm the only one doing this, that I have made um, about AI, there's been a lot of questions about what does the future of employment look like and or is ai gonna steal everybody's jobs and i'm curious if you have any thoughts here and one of the biggest questions that i have been seeing is what jobs um do you think or do other people think are going to be created because of ai um i'm curious if you have any thoughts about that but just in general like jobs ai marketing we already talked about how mar marketing costs are going to possibly go way, way, way down um, because of automation. So what does that mean for marketing? Yeah, I mean, are jobs going to be lost? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes, they are. Um, at what scale? Yeah. I don't know. Because I still believe there has to be human oversight on pretty much everything that we do in the world. I mean... I believe we all do remember the Tesla robot who attacked a production yeah. line worker like five months ago and had to go to the hospital with like some mm -hmm. serious wounds. Um, so we're not going to be turning everything over to terminate terminators just yet. But um, I think with, with marketing, like I mentioned before, what scares me the most is the media side. I think that's going to be impacted the most. Um, even if they deny it now, I think that's yes. going to be impacted the most. But there's still, still going to have to be human oversight. In, in so when you in say media side, do you mean things like um, journalism? Do you also mean television? Um, what else are we talking here? For anybody yeah. who's just 
familiar with the terminology. Yeah, so yeah, so we're talking journalism. We're talking basically anything that originally was could only be performed by yeah. the human brain. Mm-hmm. You know, um, putting things into context, uh, infusing emotion into something. Um, I haven't seen AI get to that point yet, um, but it might. Um, you know, reading an article about, you know, a, an athlete or an actor and maybe their um, upbringing, um, asking those questions. Um, I don't think AI will be able yeah. to do that anytime soon, but AI will be able to write 60% of the article at one point, probably within mm-hmm. a year. And so that kind of worries me because I love journalism. I love the emotion of journalism. I still think that, you know, we're not going to necessarily have like broadcast news or cable news is probably not going to be affected as much, but your local journalism might be though. And that's sort of what scares me. Right. So like, if it's like a, if it's like a kind of a, story of like kind of the human element it's gonna be incredibly hard for ai to do that is it gonna be hard for ai to say that uh the minnesota timberwolves are gonna lose to the new york knicks in the nba finals this year no because it'll just use <laughs> statistics and minnesota basic Timberwolves, facts, not right? a chance but never a chance, not a chance. <laughs> um well, I was going to say that Nick's not a chance either, but we're both two seeds, so there's a very good chance that we may end up meeting in the finals. So, <laughs> um, so yes, it'd be great because it's been a while since I've been to Minneapolis, and it would be cheaper to see the game there than it Go would be in New York. Yay. Um, so, so that's you know that's the the one area that really concerns me, um, and then also you know the basic media buying Mm -hmm. part that we spoke about, jobs lost concern me there. Um, Public relations, there may be a point where AI is able to craft something more succinct when they're pitching Mm -hmm. journalists, where a journalist may be like, wow, this is to the point. It's all killer, no filler, gives me exactly what I need and yeah, and then I can follow up with a human being to get more information, right? And that might make PR more efficient because I know I know I know a lot of journalists, I know a lot of people on the PR side, and it's this constant struggle of like, how do you pitch somebody something that yeah. stands out? And journalists are always like, just make it simple and tell me why the product works. Don't give me this whole like elaborate story of everything. I just want like a simple bullet point thing that I can read and say, yes, this interests me. No, delete kind of thing. So I think AI will find its way into PR in some capacity. Um, I do hope that AI finds its way into, and I know there is some, there are some tools now. Um, I would love AI to be more incorporated into, like LinkedIn has done, into um, job searches. So, you know, if you're a premium member on LinkedIn, it gives you the AI option where the AI can prompt, you can prompt the AI to say, am I a good fit for this job? And it reviews your, you know, your profile and it will literally tell you, you know, these are the parts that you're a good fit for. These are the parts that you're missing. Here are other jobs. LinkedIn premium like kind Um, of has that right now. I like click and that's like, yeah, it's like, does. oh, yeah. are I'm you, just... find out if you're a good fit and you click on it and it's like, yeah, or no, or you need more of this. But like, it's really good at being like, do you have enough keywords, which is probably good because that's, you know, ATS systems, but is also really bad at being like, oh, do you have the capability to do this job because you're a person and like these skills are the same skills. Right. And so I've had it difficulty with that. But what I want, I want an AI job hunting tool that goes and finds jobs that I like 
should be applying for and then just applies for them so that I don't have to do it. <laughs> well, you know, what you should do is you should, after this podcast, you should go and research. I know. If there Maybe are, there are companies. Already too. <laughs> Because if there's not, you Let's have to do your, this. Your okay. Hey, right hey audience, if you have seen a startup that does exactly what I want and just applies for jobs for me so that I don't have to do it and like break my heart over every single job application, um, please let us know in the comments down below or bother yes. them so they can sponsor the show. It'd be great. <laughs> there you go. See, look at right there. You're just like, you know, I mean, you know, two birds, one stone. We did it. We, we solved Easy. job hunting. Yes. Um, in terms of what jobs will be created by these tools, um, I think, I don't know if there will be any new marketing tools created just yet. I just can't forecast that right yeah. now um, because I feel like, all the big companies are just kind of integrating versus starting from scratch and creating yes. something new, but it'll probably happen. I just couldn't tell you in what vertical or where in the funnel. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because what I've been noticing is a lot of the tools that I've been seeing and a lot of the things that I have been thinking about when it comes to jobs um, being potentially created is uh, a lot of these new AI tools are making it easier to build new products or to figure, help you figure out how to build a company or how to create something new. And so I think when it comes to marketing people, I think marketing is always going to exist. Um, and I think excellent, there's always going to yeah. be jobs for people who are doing like really, really excellent, beautiful, top-notch work, right? Um, there are always going to be companies who want that. But I think where a lot of marketers can go is kind of like expand their expand their skill set, like not only on the marketing marketing side, but go way more into like the product side and go way more into like the business building or what is a way to make this app that we're working on or to make this company better um, and being more creative in that respect. I think the separation of like, oh, we have the crazy creative marketing people over here and the serious engineers over here. Uh, doesn't do well for business. I mean, part of the reason why Apple did as well as it was was because Steve Jobs was such a good marketer, such a good storyteller, such a good designer. And so I right. think there's going to be a lot more opportunities as long as companies allow it, allow you know people to have more wiggly careers where they're able to participate in different types of disciplines. I feel like that's a perfect fit with like marketers going more into business building um, and less into making sure that like every single ad is perfect. So, yeah, you know, one thing that AI may eliminate and make it more of a general sort of expertise of any marketer is project managers. Mm, yeah. Because, you know, project managers, kind of are meant to oversee a lot of things, but if you build a tool that your general brand marketer or your product marketer can use, there may be an elimination of that yeah. labor force and project managers may not be needed yeah. as much per se. I love a good project manager. I love a I'm good saying, project manager. I I'm, everyone thinks I'm really organized and I am, but I'm also not. <laughs> it's really helpful when you find somebody who is so type A and they're like so on it. I think yeah. I, I kind of disagree with you on there. And part of the reason why is because there's always people who will not listen to what they're told. And part of the job of a project manager is to make sure that they actually do what they're doing. And I don't know that an AI is necessarily going to be influential enough to like force people to do things. Um, it may remind them over and over again, but are they going to do it right? Like how is the AI going to make sure that it's actually executed and like, you're going to run into people who are, you know, you know, has a reason. I mean, I think if you have, if, 
if you have an AI tool that either has Morgan Freeman's voice or Taylor Swift's voice, I think people will That's listen, true. If it did me. sound, yeah, if it did sound like Morgan Freeman, that might help. Or like, <laughs> that might help. You might be like, okay, Morgan Freeman's telling me that I need to do this and is asking me what the timeline is and whether I'm within the timeline or mm -hmm. I went over um, scope. Yeah, I think I would be scared. So yeah, I think, yeah. I don't know. I I still are. I I'm still resistant to it, but I'm willing to concede upon future observations. <laughs> we are allowed to not have the same tools. opinion. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, exactly. We do not have to be on. We do not have to be. Have... <laughs> We're not perfectly aligned, Roman. <laughs> I, I am not wearing a black yeah. turtleneck as everyone can see. Just we're not in line. Carolyn has cat. I have dogs. It's okay. We can exist. Precise. Next question I have here is um, how is marketing going to change in the next five to 10 years? I feel like we've already covered that, but I'm wondering if you, is there a big picture thing you'd like to cover here before moving to tangent time? I say this with a grain of salt because I don't want to offend anybody. I think what's going to happen is that there's going to be more people looking down on their phones as they're walking on Fifth Avenue, and that's really going to irritate me. Isn't that anymore. already the case? <laughs> because AI is going to be... No, it, it, that's absolutely the case, but I'm just saying even more. So your traditional people who are respectful, who don't do that, are going to start doing that because AI is going to revolutionize whatever they really care about. And I just, I feel there's gonna be more people looking at their screens versus picking up a book. I mean, we're already at the point where, and I'm guilty as charged, I listen to audiobooks more than I read and I hate myself for that. Yeah. But you can multitask. But if you're multitasking, do yeah. you really get into the book? I don't think you do. So I've made a decision to start mm -hmm. going back to traditional reading and getting paper cuts. I think that's the only way to, to make so, this year a better year for me. I'm so glad that you <laughs> are finally stopping. embracing the Luddites yes. and going back. <laughs> so are you saying that people aren't going to buy the humane pin that projects images onto your hand? Do you think Marcus Brownlee was wrong about that? I yeah? say... Uh, there's still enough young people under the age of 12 who are going to drive that market. We're going to yes. get the humane pin. They're going to get the Stanley cup and they're going to get the humane pin <laughs> to get off their phones. <laughs> yes. There's going to be a, there's gonna be a revolution. Yeah. I think there's going to be a counter revolution because they're looking at the, the people who are slightly older yeah. than them saying they're always on their phones and depending on, yeah. on like, you know, your parents, I guess, deciding yeah. when to give you a phone, they may, may be like, I don't want to yeah. be on my phone all day like my sister. And it, it's, is. I think that's already happening. Right? Like you talk to like teens now yeah. who are like, can we please stop having phones in school? Because like, it's driving me nuts. Like there's, and then, um, and I know when I think about like it, whether or not I'm going to have kids, a lot of the conversations that I've been thinking about, I've been like, all right, when do they get a phone? When do they get to go on the internet? Because I was online at a very early age. Um, but at the same time, I also grew up with the internet and it went from being like, honestly, a place where, with a lot of nerds that wasn't too bad to getting really scary really quick. Right. So it's a totally different world now. It's like, yeah, do you really want to, introduce an elementary schooler to that immediately or yeah i mean i'm 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 old enough that i'm still upset that not until my senior year in high school did we were we allowed to use calculators in calculus <laughs> no texas <laughs> instruments were allowed for us we had to do everything by hand and now everybody just uses a calculator or their phone to do the equations. So you know what? Damn <laughs> do you want to know? Do you want to know when I first got my AAM account, when I got my AOL account? <laughs> I won't tell you. It's okay. I don't want to know. All right. 
I had, I had AOL and potted <laughs> okay. So This goes perfectly into tangent time. Um, so now we're going to do some rapid fire, fun, okay. last minute questions. Um, uh, Roman, I want you answering these as quickly as you can. Okay. Um, with as much accuracy and jokes as you can. Okay, okay. you ready? All right. So as you mentioned earlier, That's we it. talked a little bit about I'm your ready. career at eBay. But weren't you there um, when eBay acquired Elon Musk's company? Were, didn't you have some interactions there? So I'm going to plead the fifth on anything that has to do with Rude. Elon. Rude. Slightly. Yes, I was there. Um, uh, I will say that uh, out of the whole PayPal yeah. mafia, which is what they called themselves when they were acquired, um, Max Lefchin and uh, Reed Hoffman were extremely nice gentlemen. Uh, Max went on to create yeah, I know a firm. firm. That's the Pay Later app, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, but it started off sort of as kind of yeah, like a yeah. standalone banking kind of thing, mm -hmm. and then it transitioned into the payment thing, uh, the four and yeah. the four payments across a certain period. And then mm -hmm. uh, Reed Hoffman obviously created LinkedIn. Um, so he made even more money. Um, the one Elon story I can tell you is that before PayPal yeah. was PayPal, it was X.com. Okay. Now we know X.com as no. Twitter, even though nobody calls it X, right? So as part of the acquisition, eBay took full control of the domain X.com. Mm. It was eBay's domain as part of the acquisition. They changed the name to PayPal, and that's how most people know PayPal. Um, so in my job, as I mentioned to you, it was a lot about kind of brand reputation, brand awareness, social impact uh, programs to raise mm -hmm. um, funds for nonprofits. And um, at the time, uh, our CEO was still Meg Whitman, and um, she had an idea that we should auction off the domain x.com yeah. because we had no need for it. And so we um, were getting ready to do it. Um, there, I, I believe there was a couple of news leaks that, not news leaks, I think we put it out that we were going to be selling the domain, um, which funny enough, Elon yeah. finally got back, I think last year. Or he, he got bought. it back a few yeah. years ago. I'm not sure exactly. The problem was that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he bought it back a few years ago, yeah. Um, at a very low, very low price. But um, when those, um, when the outlet started uh, reporting this, um, I was sort of kind of like one of the lead contacts for it yeah. because I was overseeing the whole auction. 99.9 um, .9 of the contacts I got <laughs> were from pornographic <laughs> studios who wanted to buy the domain. And now you can put one and one yeah. together and you know why they would want to buy it and we had to kill the auction because of it because we were fearful that yeah. the news would catch light that some pornographic studio was gonna buy this and that the funds were gonna go to <laughs> i believe we were gonna give them to saint jude's hospital so can you just imagine the narrative around that so we had to kill that which killed me inside because I thought it would have been extremely funny. But after kind of like regrouping with everybody and telling them what was coming in the inbox, they're like, no, no, they're, yeah. we're killing it. We're not going to auction it off. But yes, the one time X.com was going to be up for sale and would have probably ended up in the wrong hands. That's so, so. funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Probably one of my well, favorites. And, and I mean, that was one of the reasons time. why when Elon was like, we're changing the name to X, I was just like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. But but it was mm -hmm. his to begin with. I mean, he's the one that came up with it. So, um, it might have also been partly the reason <laughs> he got fired. But you were there when he got I fired, weren't sure. you? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm going to take the fifth on all those parts that are going to be Elon because I do not want to be canceled Stan. by yeah, any Elon I, I um, fanboys or girls. Stands. Come on, Roman. You've got to be hip with the kids these say days. Fanboy or girls, so. I, I'm so far from hip or actually my hip does hurt a little bit today, but that's about it. So. Amazing. All right. The last, okay, so, I, I only have uh, one because you, you answered all question. three of the, my tangent questions, but my, my next question, we do have a lot of people who talk about, you know, trying to figure out what they want to do with their careers. We talked a little bit about like what do careers in marketing look like and whether that's potentially going into like other spheres or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious what career advice you have for young people, especially, or people who are looking to transition when it comes to AI and this new potential work revolution, if you have any thoughts on that. I'm guessing that probably the majority of the audience you have are posts. I think so. It's um, it, the if you look at the, I'll, I'll put it on the screen here okay. in case anybody wants to look. We have a su substantially large um, male audience um, who seem to be like in their twenties, thirties, forties. Okay. So I think a lot of the ones who are asking questions about this are a little bit on the younger side, but I think there's also a lot of people who. I mean, I've been thinking okay. about it. Like I'm trying to figure out how can I future proof my career so that, um, you know, I don't get written out yeah. of being hireable. Granted, am I already uh, unhireable? Possibly. <laughs> we are, we are. I mean, we are of that age, aren't we? <laughs> We're not 21, obviously, which is the, the final hiring age. Um, you know, I would say, don't be worried about what AI is going to do to you. I would focus on what AI can teach you because I feel that marketing, at least people who have degrees in marketing yeah. or adjacent degrees, so like journalism, um, mm -hmm. I think that's easily convertible into something else. Because marketing in reality mm -hmm. teaches you a lot about accountability and leadership yeah. and how to run a ship, basically. Um, doesn't matter if you're a copywriter, um, a brand strategist. So I would say continue perfecting your craft and then start learning more mm -hmm. about the other verticals sort of under the marketing umbrella. Because it might be easier if all of a sudden your specific subject matter expertise gets eliminated by AI, God forbid, which I don't think is going to happen drastically. I think it'll be a percentage. Um, you could easily slide into another marketing role. So if you're a brand strategist right now, you could easily go in, go to the client side where you're just managing the client. And like a job like that is not never going to go away in advertising, in PR, or traditional marketing um, disciplines. You're always going to need a human to be able to have a conversation with another human, especially when money is being exchanged and contracts are being written. So I would say perfect your craft in whatever marketing vertical you're in and learn a little bit about what maybe your colleagues do, what other people do sort of in the marketing sphere, because there's always an opportunity to take a slide left or a slide right into another position. So I don't think AI will totally destroy all jobs, but there are some jobs that I think AI probably will never be able to eliminate. And some of those are like account manager positions, client side leading a portfolio of business and being that primary contact with your client. Mm -hmm that I don't think AI can ever eliminate. And I don't think anybody would ever be comfortable with kind of like having that type of relationship where it's like, yeah. I'm speaking to basically a tool, you know, to manage my business. Um, so perfect your communication skills, perfect the way that you um, show empathy towards your colleagues um, and ask a lot of questions to people that work in the same building that you maybe say hi to when you're grabbing coffee, but don't really know what they actually do because you might be surprised that what they do is ideally what you'd like to do. You know, I've found situations where I've had conversations 
with people and I'm like, that sounds like a really yeah. cool job. I would love to do that versus what I'm doing now. And I won't mention where I had those various conversations, but it happens. So you never know what really is like your ideal job until you speak to enough people and get sort of like gather around everything. Um, like when you were a kid, I don't know if you did, but like yeah. I'd always gather around all my marbles to see which was the best marble. But then when we would play marbles, I'd realize mm -hmm. the most beautiful marble might not be the best marble to use when you're playing marbles. So um, not saying the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. I'm just saying right. that there's I a lot of pasture. Important. I got a very there. important question so, for you. Um, what are the chances that you've lost people. your marbles? Yeah. Um, I would say it's probably <laughs> 51, 49. I'm just not going to tell you where the percentages <laughs> lie. I'm sort of, I'm sort no, of like you're, the Senate. You're, you're a young point. Senate member. So you, could, you know, can't, um, a very young I, Senate. I, I, I actually probably would be. <laughs> I would be. I would be the second youngest, second youngest senator to. Uh, Ossoff, I believe mm. Ossoff is 46. So yes, I would be the second youngest <laughs> senator, which is a very scary thing. Maybe maybe AI can eliminate everyone who is above a certain age. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna age anybody because I've been a victim of ageism. You've been a victim of ageism, and you're like 20 years younger than I am. So <laughs> it happens. So, but that would be a really good get rid of the 80 year olds in Congress. <laughs> out. Out. <laughs> hey, poor Bernie. Leave him alone. He's a good dude. <laughs> he cares about he cares about people like you Bernie. in the Midwest. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. He doesn't really care for people who elitist people who lived in is, London, San Francisco, New York, and then decided to move to time Utah. All so, right. Well. Thank you, Roman, so much for coming today. Um, if people exactly. want to find you on the internet, how should they reach out to you? Um, so x.com, I'm just kidding, no. That, that's not for sale anymore, because Elon has it. Um, uh, LinkedIn, Roman Garcia. Uh, you know, just look up my name. Um, mm. Yep, uh, middle initial G, because uh, my middle name is Gabriel, so. If you look up Roman Gabriel Garcia, you can find me. Um, connect with me. Happy to um, answer any questions. Um, I will tell you that I am have weird sports affiliations. So if you're a Yankees fan, it's best that you don't, don't admit it. Uh, connect with me because I'm a Red Sox fan. That's <laughs> all I would this out. To so, take sports very seriously. That, I'm, uh, I'm always open. Yeah, I'm always open. Yeah, just, you know, I, I just I just want to set the foundation for the future discussions with the uh, the the future leaders of our country, wherever it goes before Skynet is created and the world is destroyed by Terminators. How about that? Actually, maybe That's I'll get course. to speak to the person who creates I Skynet like this. Yeah. and ends up yeah. creating the Terminator. Listen, if you're here to kill us all, thank you so much. Please like yeah. and subscribe yeah. and ring that yeah. bell. Leave a comment to let us know that you are going to be the one who takes over the world. And thank you so much for watching. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe and leave a comment telling me why on earth you liked this video. And um, yeah. Thank you so much. We have new videos coming out every Monday, in theory. Uh, but as some of our subscribers already know, that's not always the case, but it's Mondays. Monday's the day. Bye.